Our next speaker is Charlotte O'Brien, and she's going to describe for us how the Bio Bamboo Project demonstrates purpose-grown bamboo with biochar production and, climate, and how that would bring about climate change reversal. Thank you, Charlotte, Which button for waiting. <laughs> this way? This way, okay. Hello. Um, a little bit about myself. I did farm organically for about 25 years. I've worked on farms in Denmark, Norway, Austria, um, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Missouri, uh, Hawaii. So, and I've also, you know, traveled all through around the world. So I, I've worked with small farmers in a lot of places. And this is going to be about bamboo as a climate change hero, as a biomass. And yeah, so biomass, it has about 1,500 different uh, documented uses. It's, it has a lot of environmental services. As you can see, it, it balances water cycles. This is in northern Vietnam. And you can't miss that it balances water cycles. And the UN did research in India and shows that it also raises the water table. But we have about 1.8 million square miles of deserted soil. This is soil that at one time produced food for human people, for people. And that, to put that in perspective, that's seven times the size of Texas, or 58% of the US continent. It's also, if you look at the cropland that feeds the world, it's only 5.6 million square miles, and we've already lost 1.8. So this is that same area of bamboo in the middle 70s. That was the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And the newly formed Vietnamese government did not have any money to do much with it, so they offered one kilo of rice per person for planting bamboo for one day. They didn't have money for fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, so they just planted bamboo and let bamboo do its magic. Wow. And this is what it looks like today. Wow. Totally rest rest restored land after that much uh, decimation. So Dr. Mi Han is a Vietnamese professor, and she also wanted to prove how much bamboo can restore land. So she, working with French financing, took the worst soil that she could find, which was called the Iron Triangle, which was her hometown that had been so bombed during that war that it was called the Iron Triangle. And she planted a structural type of bamboo. And this is four years after she planted it. That's four years of growth on that bamboo. And more importantly, look at the, the ground. What you're seeing there is earthworm castings Ooh. and litter. It, it, Bamboo just has the effect of bringing soil back to life. And she just started with the very worst. If there are any soil science scientists in here that want to do a PhD, they should certainly contact her because she has all the research. It just needs somebody to bring it to the, to the West. So why is bamboo able to do this? Because bamboo is a pioneer plant. And what does that mean? A pioneer plant can establish in really bad soil. And there are a lot of different types of pioneer plants. Usually we call them weeds, but in this case, this bamboo is definitely a pioneer plant. You know, it's planted about five meters apart with not, in this case, this is in Hawaii, with no herbicides. And about five years later, it looks like that. It just brings the, the understory into alignment. Um, they did plant that with, with um, pigeon pea in between, which is a really good intermediate crop. This is also Whispering Winds Bamboo in, on Maui. Um, that plant is six years old. We counted 106 columns. I said, Rich, how come you haven't thinned this yet? He said, oh, really, 106 already? It just got away from him. So, I didn't have a camera big enough to show the, ma the massiveness of this particular plant. It's a Dendrocalamus um, asper, a black ketam, and it's, it's right now about six inches in diameter as it comes out of the ground. You can see the shoots that come up. They come up in the full diameter, and it's about 60 feet tall, and it's not a mature plant. Again, it's six and a half years old. 
So when that thing matures, oh my gosh, the biomass is going to have. And of course, it's obviously sucking down carbon. And most importantly, bamboo is also wonderful at putting, exuding carbon into the soil through what's called the, um, what Dr. Christine Jones has called the liquid carbon pathway. I'm surprised no one's talked about it yet, but the liquid carbon pathway, to say it simply, is um, you know, the plant over exudes, passes, it over photosynthesizes by 50 to 60 percent of its needs, and then it exudes that sugar down into the soil, primarily for the benefit of the mycorrhizal fungi in terms of climate change, because that's, those are the organisms that sequester the carbon in the form of globulin. So. So we're not talking about your grandfather's bamboo here, his bamboo fishing pole. That, that comb is four, three and a half to four inches wide and almost entirely solid. It has the same caloric value as wood. So in terms of making biochar, it's a wonderful biomass. You can plant it with tissue culture. In addition to getting structural bamboo, you get about a ton of um, bamboo shoots. And I just love pictures of biomass. This is the famous Moso bamboo from China. I've spent, been to China eight times. If you let bamboo go without managing, without people managing it, it really gets away from you. So every year you have to cut 25 to 30 percent of the mass. And if you don't, like this bamboo in Cambodia, it just goes wild. And you really lose the sequestration ability. I mean, it's it just kind of goes dormant after about 10 or 12 years of growth. And then, so you've got to keep cutting it to keep it going, keep it going. It grows in temperate zones up in China, snows on it every year. Africa, it'll grow down as, with as low as 17 inches of rain a year. And if it gets dry in any particular season, like the monsoon season, it just drops its leaves, goes a little bit dormant, comes back. Bamboo is just an amazing plant. Lots of bamboo biomass pictures. So, this is a special bamboo for making houses. You can cut bamboo with a machete. And of course, when you cut it, you've still got the rest, 75% of the plant holding back the erosion. And you can take it to town on your bicycle. Or you can float it down the river. That's what they do in Vietnam. You just throw it in the river, float it down to the mills, and then they wrench it out. You can put it on your mule. And of course, there's always the rickshaw. Or you can pile it up and just call the buyers and say, bring your truck. And they come with little trucks like that. So, so bamboo is considered to give about 30 tons of biomass per year, per hectare. And in India, they are saying as high as 55 tons per year, per hectare. These, it's being made here into disposable chopsticks. Unfortunately, they're disposable. They use a lot of them in Asia. It, in a nearby factory, they're making um, weavings that become, I'll show you more, a weaving like that that then will become a, uh, a, a plywood type of product. This is considered the best job in this area. These people that, live, uh, that work here are extremely happy with this job. And it goes on to presses and becomes a building material that's in incredibly strong. I brought a little bamboo plywood with me. So from that process, you get a lot of biomass, waste biomass. And I think this is really important. There's a lot of discussion about biomass and about making replacement fuels. But in my opinion, the biomass should have a primary purpose, you know, making a timber replacement, doing something that's good for the community, something that's good for economically. And in this case, this this uh, particular culture that I spent a lot of time in, the bamboo is the money that drives this small, their economy, oops. Um, 
And I like to call this the bamboo culture. You know, we, we talk about the two to three billion people that live on very little money, the, the land-based farmers, and these are those people. Now, these are not the people causing climate change. These are the low-impact, low-footprint people. I mean, have you ever tried to carry enough corn stalks to a cow to feed it? It's a big job. Just very, very, very simple lifestyle. In that area, it's just like going back in time. The culture is still there. This is, this is northern Vietnam, yeah. And um, I, I'm making a point of this because I feel that we in the West who have caused this problem need to partner with these people. Because these are the people that can benefit from growing the biomass that does the work to draw down the carbon they can benefit from it financially, and we can pay for that. And I think the best way to do that is voluntary carbon credits. Because I know there are, there are places around the world that are getting $20 a ton for their carbon credits voluntarily, because there are people that are just going to say, I need to step up the plate, and I need to put my money down. We cannot wait for the governments to do it. We just can't wait. So these are the people that actually will do the work. They're hauling gravel down a river in a boat. I mean, that's their job. It's a very, very simple lifestyle. I traveled about 200 miles on my motorbike this day, and I saw people making roads by hand every place I went. They were boiling tar, carrying it out, putting rocks in it, and they had one piece of equipment. It was an old-fashioned steamroller to come along and roll over what they had done. It's a work ethic that we have long lost. This woman is collecting stones so that she can make a house like that. She's collecting the stones. My, our office manager in Vietnam, she did that as a child. She collected those stones for their house. So that house, a house in Vietnam, costs about $3,000. So we say, gosh, you don't make very much in a day, but you know, you really don't spend very much for your house either. You're not air conditioned and you're not heating it. So it's a, just an entirely different mindset. This man is a school teacher. He and his wife are watering their bananas in the traditional system. And, you know, it's an old culture. It's a really old culture. And I like to say that it's, Bamboo brings money into their, into their culture to buy shoes for the kids and allow the ladies a day out. These women, I'm just walking down the marketplace and look over and they're, they're drinking hooch. That's homemade hooch on the table. And they're having a day out and drinking their hooch. And I thought that was just really funny. So going back to bamboo and all the things it can do, it's an amazing product. It just makes fences and bridges. Of course, that bridge washes out every year with the monsoon, but you know, they build it again. They use the tops to make, to make uh, brooms. This is in China. This is in China. They make, that's strawberries under a bamboo greenhouse, fences, pig pens, hotels. It, about six years ago, they started to treat bamboo with borates, the same thing that we do in Hawaii with our lumber. And that also you can do it with pressure treating. And that allows millionaires to live in bamboo houses now. These houses, I used to work at this factory in Vietnam, these houses are, are made at the factory. You can have bamboo doors and stairs and floors and walls and this is the factory. They're panelized, wonderful working conditions, you know, time off, work insurance, what do you call it, health insurance, um, all that sort of thing. And good working conditions. Jörg Strom makes bridges out of bamboo. He makes big bridges. And they're really, really strong. They draw, can drive a small truck over that bridge. There really is nothing stronger than bamboo. Um, school cafe, wonderful joinery. This is a house I lived in on the factory ground in Vietnam. It has no plywood in it. That's just bamboo weaving inside and out. That's just a bamboo weaving woven wall, and it's good enough for guests. Uh, Simone Valdez has gone to New Heights with 
technical ways of building with bamboo. He built this in Germany, that in Mexico. Rashmir is, a, is an architect from Nepal, and she builds bamboo houses for Habitat for Humanity, low-income houses that then they can plaster. Of course, the Chinese make high-value products out of bamboo. You've all seen them, I'm sure, but the flooring, laminated flooring, pressed bamboo, and they've even started making 100% bamboo houses. That means five minutes, okay. And the Chinese factories are not as nice as the Vietnamese factories to work in, but a lot of labor goes into their bamboo process. Um, and they produce 5,000 tons of biomass every day from that one industry, just from the bamboo industry, 5,000 tons every day. Unfortunately, most of it goes into boilers to create the heat to dry their bamboo and that sort of thing. If they were to use those 5,000 tons a day in, a, in pyrolysis, where you take, so pyrolysis is where you heat a, uh, a biomass to about 500 degrees Celsius with restricted oxygen. And then from that process you get biochar, you get pyrolysis oil, and you can get syngas and thermal energy. So you don't get it all at once. You, get a pro you can select which of those things you want to get. Primarily, so our company, Carbon Draw Down Solutions, is focused on providing the appropriate style paralysis for different applications. Um, our goal is to use as much of the bio waste biomass in the, in the world as possible to draw down carbon and create biochar, which I'll talk about this afternoon. These systems are modular, so they're pretty much infinitely scalable. You can use a lot of different feedstocks, you know, rice straw, miscanthus, of course, bamboo, sawdust, grain mill waste, crop food waste. And the palm oil industry has a lot of waste, and we're just now delving into that. We have a um, Dr. Gary Shapiro is over there on our behalf right now. He's the guy who taught the orangutan sign language, and he's on our team, and he speaks Indonesian, so he's over there trying to figure out that industry for us. Oops. Well, um, he also is, this is from uh, Cameroon. They did an experiment with biochar there. You can see the what happened to the cornstalk in his right hand as opposed to the cornstalk in his left hand. And the, the increases in production that they got were tremendous. And I just, I love this picture. I just feel it's really important that we work, the people of the global north have to work with the people of the global south. There has to be some sort of communication, some sort of, shoot, sorry, um, <laughs> some sort of uh, cooperation there so that the, the carbon that is in the air you can eventually hold in your hand before you put it in the soil. Two minutes, okay. So, uh, as long as I still have two minutes. So I wanna go back to the, to the liquid carbon pathway that is described by Dr. Christine Jones. So the, the significance is we can make biochar and that is a sequestration of carbon, obviously, that you can hold in your hand. But the secondary sequestration is in the liquid carbon pathway. And the, the purpose is the biochar car can carry the microbes and, and get the microbes going so that you get this drawdown. We've heard a little bit about it, but the way that um, the way I understand it is that the plants, by over photosynthesizing, feed the microbes that then use that carbon to make the glomalin and kind of, you know, hold the soil together so that you have a, you have airways and waterways and um, into the soil, and you also have the mycorrhizal fungi, which actually grow to 12,000 linear miles in a cubic yard. 12,000 linear miles in a cubic yard, so that those they are the real workers of carbon drawdown. So first we can do our part in making the biochar and growing the biomass that has all the ecological benefits. And then from that we make that into biochar and you use the biochar to feed the microbes to, to kickstart the sustainable 
agriculture that is going to do the, the heavy lifting of drawing carbon down. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I introduce you?